Uh, hi, everybody. Good morning. I'm Nick Gillespie with Reason. Uh, thanks for coming out this morning. And we are going to be talking about free speech. Uh, I want to uh, uh, recommend that everybody, if you have questions during the session or uh, burning desires, please use the uh, Whova app. Go to this, uh, uh, this meeting uh, on the Whova app and add comments at the bottom, and we'll have plenty of time for questions and discussion afterwards. Uh, free speech, kind of like the liberty movement uh, and, and populism and many of the topics that we're talking about now is a global issue uh, and there is clearly a pushback against, uh, I would say after 25 plus years of uh, vast increases in the possibilities of free speech, mostly due to technology, routing around government, uh, in all sorts of ways, we are starting to see a, a, a serious pushback that is also related oftentimes to nationalism, to identity politics, and I'd argue, uh, maybe we might talk about this a bit, that uh, populism and uh, nationalism are really forms of identity politics, but there is a movement against unfettered uh, free expression. Uh, there is a, a, a very large push, certainly in Australia and in North America and in Western Europe, to demonize certain types of free expression, uh, certain types of speech, certain words, certain ideas. Uh, and that's what we're going to be talking about today. And we have uh, Lorraine Finley, Callum Thwaites, and Ezra Levant. I am going to dispense with uh, typical uh, introductions. And we're going to start with Lorraine, then we'll go to Callum, and then we'll go to Ezra. So uh, why don't you take it away? All right. Thank you so much for having me here to start with. I always think the toughest gig at any conference is um, the early morning gig after the dinner the night before. So I appreciate the fact that you're all here. I've got my cup of coffee on the table, so I think we're good to go. Um, in terms of free speech, the point that I wanted to make here today is that in Australia at the moment, I think we're facing the biggest challenges to free speech that we have ever faced. And the issue that I wanted to focus on is Section 18C, but that isn't the only battle that we're facing. It's just the one that's become totemic and the one that really um, is an issue that highlights everything that we're battling in terms of free speech at the moment. So what I wanted to do is three things. To start by firstly talking very quickly about some of the background, and I know most of the people in the room have that information, but that's mainly for the benefit of our international guests who might not be aware of just how bad 18C is. Then talk about where we actually are now, and finally finish off with where we're going in the future. So to go to the background, 18C is a, um, is a law that makes it unlawful to say or do something in public that offends, insults, humiliates, or intimidates somebody or that's reasonably likely to offend, insult, humiliate or intimidate somebody on the basis of their race, ethnicity, colour or nationality. Now, this has been a controversial provision since it was first introduced, but it's really carried um, steam in the last few years, starting with the Andrew Bolt case, but then moving through to the QUT case that I'm sure Callum will touch on in a moment, and the Bill Leake case. And you only need to look at those cases to really understand what a cost this section has had on the individuals who have had complaints made against them, but also the stifling effect that this section has had on our national debate about really significant public policy issues. The attitude of our political leadership to reforming 18C has been really interesting. There have been some incredibly solid champions of free speech, and many of them are in this room today. But I would say that our national leaders, at best, have been equivocal about reform. And at worst, they've been outright hostile towards it. And certainly, amongst our prime ministers, we've seen them discover enthusiasm for reforming 18C when they're in opposition. Um, and then when they get into power, that enthusiasm seems to wane. And one of the points that I'm going to make is I think the biggest problem we have about freedom of speech is that we have to spend so much time shoring up our side of politics and making sure that people who should be naturally supportive of free speech don't go soft on it, that we actually don't have the time to reach out to the people we need to reach out to to win the argument. Now, my own view is pretty straightforward in terms of 18C. I'm the co-author of a book called No Offence Intended, Why 18C is Wrong. 
and at the risk of spoiling the 300-page constitutional law cliffhanger at the end of the book, um, my view is the law is bad. And it's bad for two reasons. The first is it's constitutionally suspect. And, you know, this is something that I get very excited about. Other people may be less so. But it's constitutionally suspect for two reasons. The first is we've signed up to an international convention for the elimination of racial discrimination. And that sets certain obligations about hate speech and racial discrimination. Our law goes way beyond that. There is no international human right that stops you from being offended or that saves you from being insulted. That just doesn't exist. So we've gone further than the United Nations wanted us to in terms of stifling free speech. The second thing is we have an implied constitutional right to freedom of political communication. And putting to one side whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, whether judges should read rights into the Constitution or not, but they shouldn't, putting that to one side. We have an implied right to freedom of political communication and Section 18C breaches it. And so my view is this is a constitutionally suspect law. If it was challenged in the High Court, there would be real questions about its validity. But more importantly than that, you can talk about the legal rights and wrongs of something, but this is a morally wrong law. This is a law that philosophically at its heart is a bad law. And there are many reasons for that, but the main one to my mind is this. If all that freedom of speech means is that you have the freedom to say nice things to people about uncontroversial issues, then it isn't a freedom at all. And that's what 18C tries to enshrine into law, that you only have the right to say nice things to people about uncontroversial things. So where are we now? The path to reform has been one that has had a lot of setbacks, but when it was announced there was going to be a joint parliamentary committee into freedom of speech, we were told there was light at the end of the tunnel, that this committee was going to provide the opportunity to reform Section 18C. <coughs> Now that the report's been handed down, I don't think it's overly controversial to say that our side of politics squibbed it. The most optimistic view you can put of this report is that it provides a viable pathway to reform, <coughs> that it provides options that the parliament might like to consider to make this law better. It doesn't recommend repealing the law. It doesn't make unequivocal statements about what should happen. It does lay out a lot of evidence. There are things you can point to to say the case has been made for reforming 18C, but Parliament didn't take that up. And Parliament didn't take up the opportunity to reform Section 18C. There have been some baby steps forward. There have been some procedural changes to the Australian Human Rights Commission that have been passed by Parliament. They're positive. It's an organisation that desperately needed reform and there have been some small steps taken. However, as I said to the committee when I gave evidence before it, making procedural changes is important, that's great, but we're left with bad law. If you make procedural changes and don't change 18C, you are still left with a bad law. And you can have all the great procedures in the world, but if the law's bad, that's the end of the game right there. So we've missed a real opportunity in terms of the parliamentary committee to actually reform. And to give you an example of where Parliament sits at the moment, the proposal was put forward fairly simply, I think, to reform 18C so that you would apply a reasonable community standard when you're trying to assess whether something's offensive or not. At the moment, 18C applies a reasonable victim group standard. So the level of offendedness is judged by the victim group who's meant to be offended. That straight away lowers the bar and feeds into this identity politics. And what it means is that under 18C, what you're allowed to say depends on what group you belong to and what group you're saying things to. And the law applies differently to different people, which is a massive problem, not just in terms of freedom of speech, but in terms of equality before the law. Parliament rejected that change. Parliament couldn't bring itself to say that we should apply reasonable community standards when we're assessing offendedness. So we're left with a reasonable victim test. What that means is we treat different people differently under the law based on their group identity. And this is this Orwellian approach to defeating racism in Australia where what Parliament has effectively said is we're going to fight racism by enshrining racism and race division within our law, which to me is simply absurd. 
There are two other points about what the committee said that I just want to touch on very quickly. The first is we went in very excited, raising our constitutional point and encouraged them to read the 300 pages of, you know, constitutional fun that is the book. <laughs> and were shocked when one committee member turned around and said, well, that's nice, but we're just going to leave that to the High Court. And the view of certain members, not all, there were some fantastic, solid people on that committee, but the view of some members was issues of constitutionality should just be left to the High Court. The courts can sort it out. Now, that's great, unless you're somebody like Callum, who's then dragged through years of legal proceedings before you can get to the High Court. And the other point I'd make is the Constitution isn't something to just be left to lawyers and judges. In my view, our parliamentarians should have a little bit of concern about whether the laws they're passing are constitutional laws. And failing to turn your mind to that is simply an abrogation of your responsibility as a parliamentarian and an elected representative. The second thing that nearly every person who went before the committee arguing for reform was asked is, what is it that you want to say? You want to repeal 18C, so tell me, what is that offensive thing that you want to say that you're not allowed to say at the moment? And, you know, I've heard variations of answers. People have said, well, I simply want to say, let's not fight segregation with segregation, which is what some of the QUT students said. My answer to that is this. Why are we treating freedom of speech differently? There is no other human right where you're required to justify how you want to use it before you exercise it. You can just imagine turning up to vote and having the AEC official say to you, oh, you want to exercise your right to vote, so tell me who you want to vote for and we'll decide if you're allowed to vote or not. Or somebody wanting to exercise their freedom of religion and having somebody say to them, well, that's great, you've got freedom of religion, but tell me what religion you want to practise and we'll decide whether you can exercise it or not. Why do we treat freedom of speech differently from every other human right that we have. And the simple fact is human rights are inherent. They have an importance in and of themselves and they're valuable in and of themselves regardless of how you're going to exercise them. That's not the question. So where to from here? There are three simple points that I want to make about where we go from here. And I have to say, I started the year incredibly optimistic about reform and I'm at a point now where I'm not so sure where we go. There are two paths to reform, a parliamentary path and a judicial path. My preference would be to go down the parliamentary path. It's much more democratic to have our elected representatives standing in the parliament and making a statement about freedom of speech than it is to have seven judges on the High Court knocking it out because it's unconstitutional. Personally, I'd take either of them because any reform is good reform at this point, but the parliamentary route is a much stronger one. But where to from here? The first point is we need some parliamentary accountability. We actually need those members who should be supporters of free speech to stand up and be counted. And if they're not going to stand up and be counted, we need to ask them why. Because it's been too easy for key members of a centre-right government to squib on the issue and to say, oh, it's a second-order issue. It's not going to create a single job. Well. That may or may not be true, but if all we measured government by was whether it created jobs, we'd have a much poorer society. The second point is we need institutional accountability when it comes to free speech. And in particular, the Australian Human Rights Commission needs reform. One of the big issues on 18C was this complete lack of transparency that the IPA was central in exposing when they used freedom of information to discover there had been over 800 complaints under 18C over the last six years. So this isn't a little side issue that doesn't have an impact on people. In terms of institutional reform, I think there is a big opportunity coming up with the appointment of a new president of the AHRC. And again, what I would encourage people in this room to do is to encourage the right side of politics not to squib the opportunity. If we appoint somebody who's simply an uncontroversial, moderate, slightly more palatable version than the current president, we'll get nowhere. What we should be doing is saying who is the biggest, baddest person on our side of politics who can fight for freedom and actually use that organisation to do what it's meant to do, which is advance the cause of freedom. It's a big opportunity but I'm concerned that we might not grasp it. 
The final point that I wanted to make is about community outreach. There's a real risk with 18C that we are starting to exist in an echo chamber, that we come to right of centre conferences, we talk about freedom of speech, we're all in furious agreement about how important it is, how bad 18C is, but we're not reaching out to the people we actually need to convince. So what I would encourage people to do is to engage in those on the other side of the argument. We have to reach out to the ethnic groups who have concerns about 18C, and we have to explain to them why those concerns aren't going to be realised if 18C is repealed. We can't just be an echo chamber. We actually have to reach out to the wider community and explain how this is an issue that does affect them and does have a real impact. The final point that I'll leave you on is there is some urgency to this. It's nice to talk about freedom of speech, but we're at a point in time in Australia where this is really important to happen now. And the reason I say that is the other side of politics have made very clear what they're thinking on this issue. So we had the Shadow Attorney General come out and talk about his desire to go back to the Gillard reforms and to consolidate all of the federal anti-discrimination legislation. That means 18C won't just apply to race. It will extend to every other group identity that you can think of and freedom of speech will lose. We also had the really interesting comment by the president of the AHRC where she said she felt really bad that in Australia today, people can say whatever they want around their kitchen table. <laughs> now, she was sorry about that. That's an extraordinary statement in and of itself, but what's even more extraordinary is people weren't outraged. So we know what the opponents of free speech think, we know what they're planning to do, we know that they want to strengthen their hand, and unless we actually stop squibbing it on our side of things and start getting serious about this, we're going to be in a lot of trouble. Because I know in this room there are enormous champions of free speech, but my assessment at the moment is, to be blunt, we're getting our asses kicked, and unless we actually change strategy, it's going to get worse in the future. So on that optimistic note, yeah. I'll hand over to Callum. <laughs> Interesting to see the future of Australia as a uh, world without kitchen tables, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> At least we'll all be thinner. Uh, Callum, uh, you've got about 10 minutes, so uh, let us uh, know what you're thinking. Thank you. Well, thank you all for being here so early on Sunday morning. My name is Callum Thwaites, and I'm going to start with something that someone said to me last time I was in Sydney, celebrating the life of a great man. And that was that he shouldn't know my name. And I agree. He should not, and you should not know my name. I should not be here today talking to you. I should be in Brisbane. I should be at the end of my studies, and I should be months from becoming a high school teacher. But I'm not. That's not how my life has panned out. That's not how the world has played out. Instead, my life took a, a sharp right turn that started on the 28th of May, 2013. I study at the Queensland University of Technology, or QUT, and on the 28th of May, three students, one of whom is Alex Wood, an engineering student, went into a computer lab at the Brisbane campus of QUT. Alex and his two friends had no idea that the room they walked into was an unsigned, Indigenous-only computer lab. Shortly after entering, quietly, peacefully, and sitting down, a staff member came up to Alex and his friends and asked them if they were Indigenous. They weren't, and they said no. She told them that they weren't allowed to use these facilities, they were for Indigenous students only, and they had to leave. So he did. 45 minutes or so later, after finding another computer, Alex posted on Facebook. In a Facebook group, he said the following just got kicked out of the unsigned Indigenous computer room. QUT stopping segregation with segregation, dot, dot, dot. This led to a long string of comments from students at QUT and non-students alike. People were discussing whether or not an Indigenous-only computer lab is a good policy. Some people asked in humour, why is it that it's OK to have an Indigenous-only room but not a white supremacist-only room? And among these comments was a sole comment from a Facebook account portraying itself as me. This isn't, as some 
ill-informed commentators have tried to say in the past are hacking. This was a case of a stolen identity. So I'd like to believe that this person that used my name and my picture was trying to catfish people. <laughs> I, I doubt it. It was probably not that sophisticated. It was probably just a shitty practical joke. Not too long after Alex's post blew up, the staff member who kicked him out was informed about the post by some students. She decided that because she kicked Alex out of the room and because she is Indigenous, the comments were about her. The jokes about white supremacy weren't jokes about white supremacy to show the absurdity of the policy. They were code for an underground white supremacist movement that now had her in their sights. How she came to this view when she was never named, never mentioned, is something that we'll probably not know. So she complained to the director of her unit and then to the director of equity at QUT. And she made it very clear that this must be taken further and the students who participated and those who simply liked the posts must be reprimanded in some way. Those are her words, not mine. So the university contacted a number of the commentators, not all of them, not everyone was a student at QUT, not everyone has a name like Callum Thwaites. Some, for example, have a name like Chris Lee, who also commented on this post and has never been found. This is when I first found out that I'd supposedly made an offensive comment on Facebook and I was told to remove it. Well, I wrote back, I don't know what you're talking about. And I think you've got the wrong person. So the university told me, oh, don't worry about it. You've got assessment to deal with. We'll look into this. And of course, I went, OK, that's fine. You're my university. You've got my back. Little did I know I should have been really worried. So this staff member took such offence to these posts that she took time off work from the 29th of May indefinitely. She went on workers' compensation while QUT was trying to manage her complaint, which involved changing the unsigned computer lab into a signed swipe card access computer lab, to security patrols, to public statements about the, the unit. But they tried this for a year, and on the 27th of May in 2014, on the last day of the time period that she could do it, she lodged a complaint with the Australian Human Rights Commission alleging racial vilification under Section 18C of the Racial Discrimination Act. She claimed that these comments offended, insulted, humiliated and intimidated her based solely on her race. This complaint was made against QUT, two staff members and seven students. And one of them was me. Now, instead of getting, as you would expect, our involvement in the process to see what happened and what we think. Her lawyers requested that the AHRC not notify the students because they were hopeful of settling with QUT. Both the AHRC and QUT said, OK, we agree to this, and left all of the students and the two staff members in the dark. This lasted for 14 months, until the 28th of July in 2015, when not the Human Rights Commission, but QUT themselves, out of the blue, emailed me to let me know that A, there was a complaint against me alleging racial vilification, B, the complaint had gone so far as the Australian Human Rights Commission, and C, there was a conciliation conference on the 3rd of August that I could attend if I would like. So instead of having 14 months like the Australian Human Rights Commission had to deal with the complaint, or 26 months, like the university had, to deal with the complaint. I had three business days. As an education student who's never read law before in his life. Some of the other students didn't even find out about the conference and never knew it was happening. I mean, that seems fair. That seems fair, right? So as you can imagine, the conciliation conference achieved nothing. And in October, the complaint became a case in the Federal Circuit Court of Australia. And along with the documents for court, 
I received a letter that gave me the option of instead of paying this woman $250,000 that she wanted, I could pay her $5,000 and we would confidentially settle and I wouldn't be called a racist. Three students took this option and I don't blame them. Well, I didn't have $5,000. I'm not from a well-off family. My father is self-employed and that puts food on the table. That's about it. My mother had recently moved to Maribor, which is three and a half, four hours out of Brisbane, to care for her mother. And I was an unemployed education student that would get 50 bucks every now and again to tutor someone in maths. But even if I had the money, I'm not really sure that I should pay someone for something that I didn't do. So I stood my ground and I represented myself. Thankfully, I was saved from this terrible decision by the good graces of Tony Morris QC. And to be perfectly honest, without him, I don't know where I would be today, but it would not be here. So we got the cases against myself, Alex Wood, and a third student, Jackson Powell, thrown out of the court. We got her attempt to appeal thrown out of the court. And we've helped to show the population that 18C is a perverse encroachment on freedom of speech. And that the AHRC are the gatekeepers who decide what you can and can't say, what you can and can't write, what you can and can't draw. So what is freedom of speech? And why is it so damn important? This is something I've been grasping at for about six months now. I'm not a libertarian. I'm not really a political monster. Well, I wasn't. <laughs> it's taken me a long time to get to this point. And if you'd asked me this six months ago, I would have been, look, free, free speech is important, but, but how important? I believe wholeheartedly in free speech now, and I will defend it to my end. We have to have the freedom to express, the freedom to discuss, to debate, and most importantly, to disagree. Freedom of speech does not mean freedom from critique, freedom from criticism, or freedom from offence. If we can't express views that might be critical of others or their ideas, or a view that could offend, we can't express anything. And how can we share ideas in a world where the very sharing of the ideas is stifled. We need to be able to hold government and institutions to account when they're creating policy that's bad or wrong, like a separate room for Indigenous people only. No whites allowed. How can we stop these ideas if we cannot be free to talk about them, regardless of the offence that might be taken? Thank you. Thanks so much, Nick, and thanks uh, for the hospitality, folks here at the conference and the surprise speaking invitation. Um, I uh, am the president of the Rebel Dot Media, just by background, and uh, I won't talk about that for more than one minute. But uh, we have, uh, since we were founded uh, a couple years ago, we've served 900 million minutes of video, including 28 million here in Australia, and. We're here looking for more talent. We've hired Claire Lehman, Tanvir Ahmed, Alison Bevage will be starting with us on a full-time basis. Uh, our goal is to break the media political cartel, which I call the media party. And I think it is an absolute certainty that we will be charged under Section 18C. <laughs> and uh, I have a hobby, which is collecting internet domain names, and I've already purchased section18c.com and uh, repeal18c.com and uh, I'm sure we'll need them. I'm just absolutely sure we'll need them. 
very quickly, Nick, you suggested that perhaps um, censorship uh, could be deployed by nationalists or populists. I, I think it's the opposite, actually. I think it's to quell nationalism, which often doesn't have access to mainstream media, legacy media. Uh, it's, it lives in Facebook and social media. And not long ago, uh, the four big tech companies, uh, Google, YouTube, Microsoft, Facebook, and Twitter, entered into a private memorandum of understanding with the European Union to censor. So the power of that was it wasn't debated in any legislature. It was not subject to scrutiny or transparency. It was a private corporate deal that these four companies entered into. The censorship was actually outsourced to them, which I actually find far more terrifying than state censorship. Anyways, I, I, I just thought I'd share that with you. I, I, res we'll, uh, discuss more. I respect your views uh, tremendously on this issue. I believe that censorship is the core belief of the Western left. Is it war or anti-war? Really, where was Code Pink for the last eight years? Where was the, I mean, Obama droned much more than George W. Bush did. It's not war or anti-war. Is it Wall Street, good, bad, bailouts to the bank, good, bad? No, uh, bailouts and, and uh, of Western, the big three automakers or Solyndra. Those are not core immutable beliefs of the left. I believe it's censorship. Uh, look at the, the idea generators of the left, the universities. They're racked with trigger words and safe spaces. Um, and even the partisan left talk about fake news and hate speech as an attempt to, to uh, compartmentalize ideas they don't like to distinguish them from normal discourse so that they can then stamp them out. I believe that free speech is actually the central issue of our political time. Um, let me define free speech. Uh, it's so obvious if you look at the two words, but we don't think about it. Free speech means free speech that is free. Free from what? Free from other values that may be legitimate themselves, but <laughs> we've just made a decision that speech will be a higher value. So free speech may quite often be rude or offensive. It may even be false. It may even be racist or bigoted. Um, in fact, for the word free speech to mean anything, it, it has, it, free speech implies uh, that you have already judged that you will side with speech over the other values. So free speech only means something when you're talking about spicy speech, offensive speech, bigoted speech, Otherwise, like you say, if you're just talking about the weather or the sports, free speech doesn't come into play. By definition, free speech only matters when we talk about offensive things. Free speech but doesn't really work because then it's not free speech, is it? Either something else takes precedence. And we accept in advance that it will be dirty and nasty and noisy. And if we don't accept that, then just don't pretend you're for free speech. The, the butt brigade, as Salman Rushdie calls them, free speech butt, they're not for free speech. Um, so what is hate speech then? Is hate speech different from speech, free speech? No, it's just a different species of speech. Hate is a natural human emotion. If you never hate anything, you're not normal psychologically. We, we love things, we hate things. Uh, I look at the images of the planes going into the World Trade Center, and how can you not have a feeling of hatred or contempt for that? Um, if all it took to end hate speech was to pass the Love Each Other Act of 2017, we would have done that long ago. Um, I think when some people say hate speech, they mean speech that they hate. I hate that, hate speech. I think sometimes they mean speech that's said with a certain emotion in your heart. So can I say the same words you know, with a flatline emotion, and they're legal in that con context, but then if I say them with hate in my heart, are those same words now illegal? Um, or do they mean speech that causes hate? But I think sometimes we want hate. It's how we <coughs> act on that hate that's important. Do we, do we sublimate it into some positive action? Um, Martin Luther King, Gandhi, any effective change agent 
uh, mastered feelings of hate or grievance and channeled them to constructive change. Were they offensive to use the language of 18C? Almost certainly. They were offensive to the order of the day. Think of the great liberal uh, progressive victories in the last century and a half, whether it's the abolition of slavery, the equality of blacks and whites, uh, gay rights, the idea that women can vote. Each of these things were, by definition, offensive to the order of the day. If 18C had been around, for any of these. Surely, uh, I don't know who, who Australia's great modernizers and progressives were, but surely they would have been thrown in the clink themselves. Hate comes from an underlying feeling of grievance, whether that grievance is justified or not. It is very human to get upset about grievance. Using words to vent your grievance and to seek redress is an important function of free speech. In that way, hate speech is more important than love speech. Because we use hate speech to, to get at the underlying problems and to vent. I put it to you, there's a correlation between countries that don't allow free speech and those same countries where people express their grievances through violence. The places where you can't act out, shout out, holler it out, are the places where you do things more violent because you're frustrated that you have no hope to get redressed through mere words. 18, uh, let me, uh, how am I doing for time? I don't want to go on too, too long. Uh, you've got uh, uh, five more minutes. Okay, I'll hurry up. Um, let me give you three practical reasons why hate speech is good. And, and there's a lot of hate speech I don't like. Uh, I don't like Holocaust denial. I don't like racism, for example. Um, let me focus on Holocaust denial for a second. I'm Jewish myself, and I, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a sensitive subject. But let me apply three rules for why hate speech is good in my own context of my own issue and substitute your own issue, whether it's anti-gay speech, anti-women speech, whatever your issue is. For me, if I heard a Holocaust and I hear three reasons why I would accept their hateful speech even though that those ideas hurt my feelings. The first is I want to know who the haters are. If someone's allowed to say their hateful words, oh, now I know who he is. I can avoid him. Maybe I won't do business with him. I won't invite him to my party, whatever. As opposed to if he just carried that around as a secret because he couldn't fly his flag. So I want to know who's who. A second reason is um, hate speech allows a teachable moment. I happen to know about the Holocaust because I'm Jewish and because I'm a, of a certain age. But what if you're 16 years old in high school today and you're not Jewish and you had no experience with it, you weren't taught about it, you, you didn't learn about it, and you see someone getting in trouble for denying the Holocaust, but you don't know anything about it. If that moment was allowed and we had to reteach the, every generation our values, that would be much better than, than silencing a debate. I, I think uh, so many hostile questions ought to be answered rather than just to assume, oh, don't indulge that debate. Well, you have to indulge that debate. Not everyone knows the truth like you do. And the third reason is that when you outsource debating to the government, to a 911. I'm going to call it, do they have 911? Is that what they call in Australia? I'm going to call 911, call the police. Take it to the hate finder general. You know, have them inquire if this, oh, the joke tester general. I heard a joke that offended me. Take it to the government joke expert. Okay, so three years later, and how many, you know, no, 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 you're outsourcing that. How about taking civic responsibility? You hear a racist joke around the office, which is better? To call 911, as we call it in North America, or to say, hang on a second, buddy, I heard you say something. That's not how we roll around here. We don't, we don't use that language. I, I want to let you know that, and I want you to correct yourself. You took personal responsibility. You invested a little bit of yourself. That's citizenship, as opposed to saying, oh, I'm, not gonna, I'm just going to call the government, and they'll take care of it. So I think those are three reasons why hate speech is good. I looked at the text of 18C, quote, reasonably likely in all the circumstances to offend, insult, humiliate, or intimidate another person or a group of people. Uh, so that, that's the text, the operative text of 18C, isn't it? In Canada, I was prosecuted uh, for publishing the Danish cartoons of Mohammed in a news story. Not in an opinion. They were not my own cartoons. We showed the cartoons in as, as an exhibit to the story, as a prosecutor would put a piece of evidence to the jury. Here's exhibit A. Here's what all the fuss is about. Now let's talk about it. For the mere act of showing those cartoons, I was prosecuted under the law, and I know it from memory. I published something, quote, likely to expose a person or persons to hatred or contempt. So that likely to is in both. That's a future, future tense crime, isn't it? It's like that movie, uh, that Phil K. Dick movie we were talking about, Nick, uh, Minority Report. Uh, you swoop in and arrest someone. I didn't do anything. I didn't say you did. 
I just say, you might. <laughs> well, there's, there really isn't an, a defense to that, is there? A future tense crime. And what is the crime? There are some future tense crimes. Uttering a credible and imminent death threat. That's actually a future tense crime, but it's so imminent. The test is so high. You, you can't say, I'm going to kill you. You won't be pro It has to be so imminent and terrifying. Um, that, that's what assault is. But, but what's the operative word here? Likely to, in Canada, expose a person to hatred or contempt. What does that even mean? Likely to offend or insult. Likely to. So they, they don't even have to have happened. It just it might happen. And what, likely to punch someone in the nose? That's what assault is. No, likely to offend someone. I'm sorry, that is not a that is not even a real crime. And and as you can quickly see, there are no defenses there. There's no defense of truth. What's truth got to do whether or not the, the truth is quite offensive, isn't it? Um, fair comment, what's that got to do with offense? I'm offended by your fair comment. So what I'm offended. And the test is so subjective. What bothers me the most, and I must say, I detected even in your outstanding <coughs> comments, I've, I learned so much from listening to you, but, but I think you accept the framework. You accept the phrasing, Human Rights Commission. But it is none of those things. Who wouldn't love a Human Rights Commission? I love humans, I love rights, and they seem committed. But <laughs> why, why, sh why should we allow them access to those pretty words? Now, do you guys say kangaroo court down here? Because we say that in Canada. You have to rename things, kangaroo court, the star chamber, although that's not fair to the star chamber, which did some good work. Uh, <laughs> there is no right not to be offended. That is a counterfeit human right. Say that, a counterfeit human right not to be offended. There is a real right to be offended. It's a wonderful right. They don't have it in every country. Um, the, the Human Rights Commission, if it's like it is in my country, there are many procedural flaws from the partiality of the commissioners to the lack of evidentiary and procedural standards to cost consequences. In my country, if you sue someone in civil court and lose, you have to pay them their costs when you lose. I, I understand uh, it's different here. I, I, I could be educated on that. Um, let me say this, I think you should, and again, forgive my outsider's expertise, uh, which is uh, very low, I'm sure, but that doesn't stop me from confidently offering it. Um, <laughs> I, think, I think you have to denormalize the Human Rights Commission. You have to stop using its words. It's not a human right not to be offended, it's a counterfeit human right. They're not human rights commissions, at best they're so-called human rights commissions, or kangaroo courts, or sham courts, or partisan courts, or star chambers. I think you have to constantly look at the personalities involved and how they are intemperate and would not survive as judges on the bench. I think you should use tools in your country, if they're like ours, access to information style requests about everyone involved, about something as irrelevant as their expense accounts. Of course that's irrelevant to the morality of the commission, but it's part of the denormalization, that these people are unacceptable. Callum, I spoke with you yesterday and heard your story. They tried to denormalize you, didn't they? They tried to deperson you. They tried to say you are outside the norm, but in reality, they're the ones who are abnormal. They are the ones who are perverting human rights. How dare they seek to otherize you? I think the Human Rights Commission must be denormalized, which is a nicer way of saying demonized. But we have to show it's not normal, that they are actually underminers of human rights commissions. And it, had they not such a beautiful name, they would likely have been exposed already. Nick, I know I'm out of time, so I'll, I, I would close by saying, make alliances with normal people on this, with true liberals, to show that it is not normal to censor offensive comments. And in closing, be badly behaved, be badly behaved, because they can't go after everybody. <laughs> Thanks for your time. Thank you uh, very much, Ezra, and uh, we'll go right to questions now. And again, remember, add your uh, comments and questions on the Whova app for this. And uh, why don't we pick it up with, um, uh, a question from uh, Paul Madsen, which I think for the two Australians, 
As libertarians, uh, should we be advocating for re the repealing of the RDA in its entirety instead of focusing just on 18C? <laughs> Lorraine, do you want to go first? Or? I think for too long when it comes to human rights, and I've used this term with Callum a lot, we vacate the field. You know, when it comes to issues of race, when it comes to issues of gender, when it comes to all of these issues that are sensitive and politically incorrect, we simply don't talk about them. So when it comes to the Racial Discrimination Act, we're not willing to even enter the fray when it comes to talking about what's right, what's wrong, what's working, what's not. Is this legislation that should be there? Because as Ezra said, we accept the premise. And so we start from behind the eight ball to begin with because we accept these human rights instruments as simply being there and immutable and unchangeable, when in actual fact, there's no one in this room I imagine who would stand up and say, you know what, I hate human rights. I don't think they're a good thing. Everybody believes in human rights. When we talk about repealing the RDA, it's not because we're saying we're all huge raving racists who want to get out there and just be horribly racist to people. We're just saying we think there's a better way to beat racial discrimination. And my view is you don't beat racism by entrenching racism. You don't defeat sexism by entrenching sexism. And what we've allowed to have happen is a whole ra um, raft of what were meant to be temporary measures become permanent entrenched parts of our society that you can't criticise for fear of being, calling big being called bigoted. Well, I'll start with if I end up offending anybody based on your race, you can go to the Human Rights Commission's website and fill in the form and we can give it another crack. Um, <laughs> there may have been a time where we needed racial discrimination legislation, but I don't think we're in that time anymore. I don't believe that it's helping. It's just establishing this victimhood mentality and it's perpetrating it. We aren't doing Indigenous people a favour by treating them with kid gloves. We aren't doing any ethnic groups a favour by treating them with kid gloves. Are we all not humans? Does race matter that much? I think we need to start actually having a conversation about it because if we don't talk about it, nothing's going to change. Um, as a uh, uh, follow-up question, uh, here is uh, from James Reed asks, as freedom of speech is largely a Western ideal, could you comment on how changing demographics via mass immigration into Western nations are contributing to the erosion of free speech? Ezra, do you want to uh, start with that? Sure. Um, I, I have a slightly different take on it. In Canada, our hate speech laws were actually generated by the Jews, um, obviously through our civic Parliament, but those lobbying for were Jews who, whose feelings were hurt by uh, echoes of Nazism. So in the 60s and 70s, um, these laws were put into place, and for the first decade, it was Jews complaining about powerless neo-Nazis, like absolutely fringe nobodies. All right, but the whole concept of the law is precedent, and what's good for the goose is good for the gander. And so in the last 10 or 15 years, as mass Muslim migration has come to Canada, why should a Muslim activist not be able to use this to censor his political enemy if the Jews could use it to silence their political enemies? And so while in Canada, not a single Muslim extremist preaching murder in a mosque has ever been charged, let alone convicted, under our hate speech laws, Jews have started to be um, for it because is Zionism not likely to cause hatred or contempt against an identifiable group? Could you not convince some extremist commissioner to, to run with that for a few years? So in fact, while I believe that some immigrant cultures do not share our uniquely Western value of freedom of speech, I also cannot lay all the blame at their feet for it was our own cultural Marxists and our own erosion of our ancient belief in free speech who gave them the tools. It was a Muslim extremist who filed the complaints against the Danish cartoons that I published. But it was a Canadian-born, white, liberal, post-everythingist uh, system that put me through 900 days of a ringer. 
Yeah, that's um, it's fascinating that really uh, it, this is a case where I think a lot of times immigrants get scapegoated, and they're not the ones who are generally calling for censorship. It, it predates them. Could you talk a little bit about, uh, I mean, you mentioned it in the comments, but the disposition ultimately of your case, which uh, was a gigantic deal in uh, North America, certainly. And uh, we, we got into uh, you know, just an insane situation, including there was a book about the Danish cartoon that was published by Yale University Press, a scholarly book, where they did not publish the cartoons that the book was about. And it was supposed to be a full airing of what was going on there. And, and we just get to this insane moment where we cannot talk about what we're talking about in a very convoluted way. And, and the irony is that the cartoons themselves, there were 12 of them, most of them were quite innocuous. Uh, the, well, this is, uh, I personally, as a journalist, the one art form I would be in favor of censoring are editorial cartoons. They are terrible, as a, and uh, even the Muhammad cartoons were, uh, were awful. Uh, um, someone named Kare Blutgen in Denmark wanted to do a child's illustrated Koran. That sounds interesting. I'd read it. He couldn't get anyone to, to do the cartoons. Then Politiken, which is a political mag, wrote a story about it. And then the, the Yulins Post and said, well, geez, we'll do this. And they wrote a letter to every editorial cartoonist in the association and offered them, I think it was like 80 bucks each. So 12 people said, sure, I'll take 80 bucks. And, and you can see the work was worth about 80 bucks each. <laughs> um, one of them was like a stylized Olympic logo. One, some of them made fun of Kare Blutgen. Um, some of them showed cartoonists drawing, like, some are interesting, some are boring, some are mocking, but the fact that they were not shown, not by the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal or the LA Times or, or the National Review, I, I can't remember if Reason did. Uh, we, uh, we, did, we showed them on our website, not in our uh, print magazine, okay. but your, uh, your publication set the standard, I think, in, in going balls out on that, and, uh, you know, thank you for that, and... Uh, but so what happened in sure. the end? Well, and let me just, in 10 more seconds on that. The fact that the, the Western media, which will show any blasphemy, any lasciviousness, any sexuality or obscenity, would not show these cartoons. Well, what could a normal reader think? But boy, they must be bad. But they were quite banal. In the end, at 900 days in, and I did access to information requests, 12 different, going from memory now, 12 different government bureaucrats and lawyers touching the file, about a quarter million dollars worth of government expense, my own expense of about a hundred grand. Um, the matter was dropped like a sack of potatoes 900 days in. They didn't, I never actually got my day in court. They were so pounded and pummeled in the court of public opinion. And that, I think Reason actually published an excerpt from my book on the subject, how the internet saved my tongue was how it was labeled in, in Reason. And, and that's my point about being badly behaved. Had I submitted to this star chamber process, I would have been in their terms. And I would not have, uh, what I needed to do is drag their bad behavior and their outrageous laws into the light of scrutiny and blog it and YouTube it. And how did I pay my bills? PayPal it. And they're not, they weren't used to that. They were used to fighting against people who either took the deal, I was offered, $10,000 fine and to give this imam who complained one page in our magazine that I couldn't edit. <laughs> this was a government brokered offer, 10 grand and he gets a page in my mag. Could you imagine that? Well, you can't, you can't take that. And, but by smashing and bashing and being very badly behaved, they said we cannot, we will not survive the PR consequences of this. For 30 odd years, they had, the Canadian Human Rights Commission had a 100% conviction rate because there's no defense. Truth is not a defense, fair comment is not a defense. I should say that with Mark Stein's tremendous help, he was charged in three human rights commissions for the same, like triple jeopardy, for the same thing. In the end, uh, his went to term and he was acquitted, but that is no victory. To have the censor say, I've inspected you and for this technical reason, I'll let you go this time, but you watch it. I'm sorry, that's not freedom. For the censor to give you a thumb up, thumbs up, you still went through the censorship process. Uh, so when I, my case was dropped, they gave me an explanation. It was a laughable explanation. Um, but they said, we're well, basically, we're watching you. Now, 
in the national brouhaha that came from this, especially reaching out to journalists on the center left who actually still cared about freedom. There was enough momentum that we repealed our national section 13. I'm worried it'll be unrepealed and brought back in, but you have to take it out by the root. It's not enough to modify section 18C. It has to be repealed. And if you can dig up the roots of the larger tree, there's no need for a human rights commission. Uh, thank you. Lorraine, I'm going to take the uh, moderator's prerogative, and I think you uh, said something really uh, important and interesting, and I'd like you to expand on it when you said that uh, people who believe in freedom of speech need to reach out from their own echo chamber. Um, how do, what, what kind of success have you had with that, and what are the, the kind of specific strategies or arguments that you make to people who might be protected under various kinds of hate speech laws? Uh, um, well, I think a lot of it actually was said yesterday in the panel uh, by Naomi when she spoke about personal stories. The most powerful thing that has been going for reforming 18C is Callum speaking out. Um, you know... <laughs> You know, as much as I like to think, you know, I can make this powerful constitutional argument and it's compelling and it's gripping and most people tune out um, because most people don't want to read 300 pages of constitutional goodness. Um, but, you know, you hear Callum speak and it suddenly hits you that, you know, this isn't just an abstract, this isn't just theoretical, this can happen to real Australians or real people and it can happen to people who aren't political monsters who aren't out there, you know, deliberately creating waves, who aren't... You know, what happens to somebody like an Andrew Bolt, ordinary Australians look at him and go, well, I'm not Andrew Bolt. You know, I'm not out there deliberately trying to, you know, um, give controversial opinions. When it happens to a Callum Thwaites, you sit there and go, oh, my goodness, I've liked Facebook posts before that, you know, are as innocuous as that. I've said things on Facebook that are far worse than what was said in the QUT case, that could happen to me. So I think that's really important. The other thing is not to be afraid of going in and actually talking to groups that have concerns about 18C. And when you're doing that, what I've found is the most important thing is not to tell them they're stupid. Groups that have fears about 18C have real fears. You know, I've spoken to, for example, Indigenous groups who are really concerned because they've been told that if 18C is repealed, this wave of racism is going to come tumbling down on them. And it's only when you actually sit and have a dialogue and talk about it, not starting from a position of you are just wrong, but actually listening to concerns and talking about them, that you can swing people around to, um, to believing in the cause of free speech and realising that that's actually the best protection that you have against racism. Freedom of speech is the best protector against racism. Thank you. Uh, Callum, do you want to... Uh... Talk a little bit about it, and the, uh, this, uh, I realize it's uh, got to be kind of painful, but um, what is it like to become a cause? And um, do you, I mean, if, if you could do it all over again, not, uh, not back down, but uh, you, you would rather have avoided all of this, wouldn't you? Oh, it's different. It's definitely different. Um, I don't know. There was a time when, when I would have backed down. In the middle of it, when we're waiting for a judgment, the media was at its heaviest. There were criticisms coming from certain media organisations that some may call literal piles of garbage. <laughs> thank, thank you, Trump. Um, I would have backed down. Looking back now, I'm very happy I didn't. It's very weird to become almost a household name. Um, and I, I sort of think that if my name was Chris Lee, like, like one of the students is, no one would know who I am. So it's, it's very lucky. And, and I'm, I just want to stop this from ever happening to someone else. If I can stop you from going through this, if I can stop someone's family from enduring what my family endured, then it was all worth it. Ezra, you, uh, you uh, said uh, it's an interesting proposition. I'm not sure if I believe it uh, when you said censorship is the core value of the Western left. Um, 
Could you explain a little bit how, I mean, only a few decades ago, really, oftentimes it was people on the left who were working to expand the sphere of legal speech, uh, whether it was about, uh, you know, the publication. Uh, I don't know what the uh, history in Australia is, but uh, for, and, or actually, for that matter, in Canada, uh, it was only in the early 1960s that such uh, horrible books as Lady Chatterley's Lover and Ulysses by James Joyce, Tropic of Cancer by Henry Miller were allowed to be published legally in the United States. Uh, almost all of the expansions of free speech came from the left. Um, what happened to the left where if, you know, they went from pushing for more speech to now really harshly limiting speech in your view? I think uh, most of the liberal free speech activists in the 60s and 70s, I think most of them meant it. Um, but I think a lot of them, it was just a tactic. When you're attacking the establishment, which any reformer does, a reformer of the left or the right, you have no other sources of power. Speech is your power. I'm not sure who first said it, but li I like the phrase uh, that f freedom of speech is the strategic freedom upon which others are built, or the saying, take away all my rights except for free speech, and with that, I'll win them back. And so if you have nothing, think of Martin Luther King, think of Gandhi. If you have power already, you don't need free speech. You can get things done in a phone call or an email or with a, or with a check. So if you're, if you're an anti-war protester in the 60s and 70s, free speech is a very important tool for you. Uh, if you're a sexual progressive trying to break down church morality on homosexuality, for example, free speech is a, power to, a powerful tool for you. But look today when so many of the great missions of the 60s have come to full fruition. And now the radicals of the 60s are the professors and deans of our era. Bill Ayers himself is a professor. Well, and look at the, look who's on the ramparts, these Trumpy guys with their MAGA hats and these pro-life student clubs. In Canada, pro-life student clubs are shut down all the time. Milo Yiannopoulos at Berkeley kept out. Ann Coulter at Berkeley kept out because some of them didn't mean it. They just meant it as a weapon. And they, you know, free speech is a tool you have to give to your opponent. It's a gift you have to give to your opponent if you want it for yourself. That's the hardest thing about free speech is it doesn't just apply to you. And a lot of the, a lot of the deciders these days, they only want it for themselves. Yeah, it's uh, fascinating, the, uh, the, the spectacle of Berkeley becoming the uh, kind of epitome of uh, anti-free speech um, is fascinating. In the mid-60s, what was called the free speech movement in the United States on college campuses started at Berkeley, and it was because the, the context of that was that unless you were in one of two student groups, and I believe it was the college Republicans and the college Democrats, you were not allowed to leaflet on campus, you were not allowed to talk about politics. And a spontaneous movement arose to, uh, by students to insist on being able to talk about whatever they wanted to, wherever. And now they are talking about restricting speech to only that which they want to talk about in very constrained ways. So it's a really kind of deadly irony. I think we've got um, a couple of minutes left. Uh, and it might, uh, uh, let, me, let me throw one more question out to the group, and then maybe if you want to each make a, a final statement or two. Um, uh, to go back to uh, what Ezra was talking about, um, how is the interplay between government censorship and corporate censorship of, uh, how is that playing out in Canada, and is that a threat, and how, how, how do you meet that in, in an Australian context? I actually think it's a really live issue in Australia at the moment when you look at the way that big business is getting railroaded into taking positions on social issues and issues of values. And it strikes me as ironic that business is afraid in Australia to speak out on core issues of economic reform. When you talk about industrial relations, when you talk about um, the need for budget repair, the corporate world goes missing in action and they leave it to government. But when you talk about social issues... They're all over it. And I think, you know, the, 
the conversation between Andrew Hastie and Tim Wilson and the discussion that happened around that, to me, was absolutely outrageous because whatever your views are on same-sex marriage, the fact that we couldn't have two people sitting down and having a civil discussion without suddenly pressure being put on a brewery to withdraw their sponsorship and without things being withdrawn from the internet and the whole thing being shut down was absolutely extraordinary. And it just goes to show that people don't want to talk about ideas, they want to shut down debate. And if I can just give one example from um, back home, I'm from Western Australia, and you may have heard we had a state election that didn't go so well recently. Um, but we had an issue called Row 8, which was a big transport project out there that, in my view, is incredibly important um, for the state and for the area I, I live in, but it has enormous environmental issues tied around it. It's been tied up in court for years. Just before the election, there were months of protesters out at the site. They were protesting every day. They had the media there. They had bulldozers. It was hugely controversial. And one of these protesters appeared on TV and said, all we want is to be listened to. And you turned around and went, well, you've been on media for the last number of years. You've dragged this thing through the court for years and had opportunity after opportunity after opportunity to have your say. And it struck me that what they're saying isn't, I want to be heard. They're saying, I want you to agree with me. And it's a fundamentally different thing. The right to be heard, the right to speak, doesn't mean there's a right to be agreed with. And it's an important distinction. Thank you. Um, Ezra, do you feel, uh, I mean, I guess it was about a year ago that the uh, European Union started to announce certain types of speech restrictions on internet sites. Um, obviously, you, you mentioned uh, companies like Facebook, Google, uh, et cetera, kind of putting into practice certain types of speech restrictions or uh, screwing around with things, uh, the way that things uh, kind of show up in, in people's feeds or what is considered real news and fake news. Do you feel that the kind of bad behavior and the bad publicity that comes out of that, is that having an effect on, on corporate behavior in the direction of more free speech, or do they kind of will it away and, and work with government agencies that, uh, that are pushing the same agenda? You know, I've, I've always been skeptical. I mean, I think the world is crazy enough that we don't need to indulge in conspiracy theories. There's enough conspiracy facts out there. We don't need to go further. But over the last year and a half, there are certain things that are yeah, indisputable. For example, uh, Schmidt, Eric Schmidt, uh, the senior VP of, executive VP of Google, writing in the New York Times that he wants there to be an autocorrect for hate. And, and you can see that uh, in early forms of it. If you type certain things in Twitter or Facebook, it will say you've, your account has been suspended for a day or a week or 30 days unless you delete it. So, so this is not a conspiracy theory. I mean, I, I, uh, we have to be careful that we don't indulge in uh, speculation of Orwell, but we don't need to. There's enough of it out there. And I'm sorry, I've never heard of Orwell. Who is that? Well, and th yeah. that's the thing. I mean, to me, uh, 1984 was really about language, wasn't it? And I, I mean, if you remember, um, cutting out newspaper stories and revising things and and, langu and words you couldn't even say. And I think that's actually happening. Uh, that's what Eric Schmidt talks about. 30,000 pro-Marine Le Pen Facebook pages were deleted by Mark Zuckerberg. Um, I find these things concerning. Islamophobia, there's now a motion that has passed the Canadian Parliament calling for a, quote, whole of government approach to, quote, eliminating Islamophobia. What is that? Is that a human emotion, a fear? Is that criticisms of the doctrine or the philosophy? And this has been seeping into Google, Facebook, Microsoft, YouTube. Nick, we, we don't even know really what's going on because we don't have the access to the decision making in these corporations. I'm not a trust buster. I'm not a... I'm not a, someone who wants to take on the oligarchs, but what happens when you have four companies who control everything, every form of digital communication, and there, there isn't another YouTube of size, there isn't another Google or Twitter of size. What do you do when they say you cannot talk about this subject? Last point, we're a YouTube-driven company, 700,000 subscribers. Over the last 45 days, when whole swaths of topics of conversation are, quote, demonetized by YouTube, as in 
They'll, they're not censoring us. We can put our videos up. They simply refuse to serve ads, refuse to make ads available to advertisers who may well want to be on our ads. Just any word, Syria, Trump, even if it's banal commentary, our monetization has been cut back 80%. Luckily, we have other sources of revenue. What is that? If that was ordered from the court, I could appeal it, I could challenge it, I could get disclosure, but they, they don't answer phone calls at YouTube. You just have to live with it or go elsewhere. Thank you. Um, why don't we uh, very quickly in the last couple of minutes, uh, Callum, if you'd like to, uh, if you have a uh, exit statement that you would uh, like to make, and then we'll go to Lorraine and Ezra. Well, that YouTube bit's actually really important. I've been seeing this a lot, that people are being labeled family friendly or not. And if you're not family friendly, you don't get ads. And what, where do you go? Where do you go to, to play your videos, to put your content out? Because there's nowhere else. <coughs> and if we don't start standing up and, and saying, hey, this isn't right, this isn't the world we want to live in, if we don't start saying, I want to defend this freedom, I want to defend choices, the ability to speak, to express, to say controversial things, we're going to end up in a world where we can't say anything. <coughs> Either everything is off limits or nothing is. Thank you. Uh, Lorraine, would you... Uh... I guess the final thought that I wanted to leave you with is this is not a... Um, it doesn't have to be a big statement. It's a series of small things. It's the, you know, frog in the boiling um, pan type of thing. Not everybody is going to be a Callum Thwaites and have an opportunity to or have to endure something as big as that. But what I'm seeing increasingly, I lecture at Murdoch University, and what I'm seeing increasingly, <laughs> a cheer out from the Murdoch crowd, <laughs> is I'll give you one example, and I'm not going to talk about the whole example, but just a small bit of it. I give what I call the Freedom Lecture, where we talk about freedoms in our constitution. And as an example, I raised the Bill Lake cartoon and said, what are your thoughts? This was a controversial cartoon. What are your thoughts? One student was prepared to comment in a class of over 180. One student. And when I said to students afterwards, why didn't you speak up? They said, we don't feel we can. We don't feel we can, because we know that if we do, other students will jump on us and not debate our ideas, they'll attack us. If we speak up in certain classes, we know lecturers won't debate our ideas, they'll attack us. And we know that will be reflected in our grades. And what I would say to all of the students out there is, I understand you have to get through university, you have to get good grades, you have to get a job. And it's very easy to say, well, I'll just temper this assignment because I know my lecturer doesn't agree with me. If we start doing that, if we start taking an easy route and saying, well, I'm not going to give my opinion in class because I'm just one person, it doesn't matter, someone else can take up this fight, then we end up getting to a situation where we have no freedom of speech and it's gone and we don't really realise how we lost it in the first place. Thank you. I think what we have to realise is that every single person in this room is guilty under Section 18C, or in my country, Section 13, we are. We, everyone here has said something that's offensive. Um, the only question is, will we be charged? So it's such a capricious system. We're all guilty in advance. I think that um, people are sick of it. And one of the ways I think I cracked the code of how Donald Trump won is that there was a man who so clearly wasn't going to be part of this pack mentality. And remember when he would say outrageous things, even things that weren't really defensible, Megyn Kelly, John McCain, uh, things that made a fan of Trump like me cringe, say, why are you doing that? Why did his support go up afterwards, even when he was so manifestly wrong, even in the eyes of supporters? Taking on John McCain's veteran status, that's the only thing good about John McCain. <laughs> and it's because he showed a stubbornness not to be cowed into silence, and his very rudeness became proof that he was not afraid of being mow-mowed into silence. And the thing that was most odious about him was actually his great promise, that maybe he could end this uh, self-censorship because the man himself would not be censored. When he used the word Pocahontas for Elizabeth Warren, and when he was called out and he said, oh, you don't want me to say Pocahontas, so I shouldn't say Pocahontas? Like he just, he did, he really did that. And I think, 
I think there's some hope there and some inspiration. We don't want to be rude for rude's sake, but I think it's time for just a touch more rudeness. Thank you so much. We'll, uh, we'll leave it there. Uh, I want to thank uh, Lorraine Finley, Callum Thwaites, and Ezra Lafont for uh, talking about free speech and uh, bringing the free speech while talking about it. Thanks so much. Ezra.